Do you feel like God calls people specifically to be, be entrepreneurs? Uh, I think all of us, to some extent, has some form of entrepreneurial duty. And what does really an entrepreneur do? The definition of entrepreneur is one that takes risk. Everything in life is a risk. And you know, the, the whole safe, sound, you know, safe, secure type route isn't necessarily the route that the good Lord wants you to walk in because he wants you to continue pushing the envelope. You continue want to expand the territory. If you believe that uh, the good Lord is your savior and, and, and he's about your, that's about your life, that's what you want to do is glorify his name and that's what you feel called upon to do, well then you've got to take risk. Mr. Massapolo, <clears throat> dude, thank you so, so, so much for joining us, man. You are an absolute killer. The chief distribution officer at PHP, which isn't a small organization. I think I heard something about you guys renting out the Patriot Stadium. Is that what you just got back from? Yeah, we watched nine episodes of the Man in the Arena uh, a documentary and actually had some of Tom Brady's uh, players. They won three Super Bowls. One, one guy won three Super Bowls. The other guy won two Super Bowls with Tom Brady and his business manager of TB12 was there to unpack the mindset of a leader and a coach and coach Bill Belichick. Dude, what incredible content. And how many people were, were there? I mean, well, how did that go? What, what, was that about? We, what was that about? I think we had about, I think we had about uh, 75, 75 of our guys there. And of course, it, it's, you just can't pay to get there. You had to qualify with a certain amount of production and, uh, and volume uh, to get to this event. But uh, yeah, it was about 75 of us with spouses. Right on, man, right on. So you also host a YouTube channel, Seven Figure Squad which is something that I, I consume myself. Um, I, but one of the reasons I wanted to interview you specifically is because I believe that you have a message that I think the, um, the, the entrepreneurial world you know, really needs to hear. I believe that you, I mean, why don't you just tell me sort of your basis for how you're able to sort of merge the you know, Christian principles in the Bible along with business development and growth and just walk me through sort of that you know, vision in your head and how you came across that and why you started, started developing this. Our YouTube channel in 2019 was approximately uh, 13,000, 14,000 subs. And uh, what was prompted to us to consider doing is to do this series called Vlogmas, which was an episode a day from December 1st all the way until Christmas, providing some form of content from your channel, which is a channel, it's called Seven Fear Squad, designed to help you think like a millionaire, strategize like a millionaire. So therefore, you one day you can become a first generation cash flow millionaire. And my team was like, okay, we can do all these episodes about insurance. We can do all these episodes about financial strategies, all these episodes about entrepreneurship. But what do we talk about on Sundays? I mean, who wants to talk about insurance on Sunday? Who wants to talk about business on Sunday? And you know, that's a Lord's day, right? I said, you know what? I, I'm, on Sundays, here's what I find myself doing at church. I'm at church listening to my pastor and taking notes about things I can implement into my business. And why don't we talk about business and finance from a biblical perspective? Because that's the way I've been running my life, I, I would hope. And, and I say this and not with the expectation that I hope I don't let anybody down because I hope your expectation of me just talk about these principles is that I don't walk on water. That's, that's not the standard. There's only one guy that did that, right? And that's, that's the, the good book I'm following. And so, uh, however, I want to not only run life and do business by just be, being a good enough person because, because when people say, do you, do you, well, what happens if doing you is, is faulty? What happens, oh, I'm just gonna be me. What, what, what happens if you are faulty and you have areas that you need to improve? You want to continue doing you even though you're flawed and mistaken? Or you want to be doing you by being perfected and emptying your cup and knowing that there's another level to rise? The only way that I challenge myself and having answers for that is in the good book. That's, that's amazing. Well, when I first got to meet you in person, we were at you know Dallas at 8% Nation. Yeah. You and Patrick Bet David were in the, the VIP. So what I'd love to do is, is I'd love to understand, like, would you unpack a concept or two for me that you feel like was um, one of your most impactful concepts that you came across as you were starting to unpack this? I'm sure there were several concepts that really stood out to you as like, man, that was like Holy Spirit inspired and, and that, that nailed it. Can we, can we talk about that for a minute? Lots of times when you come across somebody from the church and say, you need to read the book of John, you know, save your life. Sure, understandable. In addition to that, I would also say, read the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Why? Because King Solomon, who's regarded as the wisest and richest king who ever lived, wrote those two books. But I'll take it even further. When I read in Matthew 25, you know, the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus talking about the parable of the talents, and, and, and I'll just do, do a quick 30 second premise of it, is that the, the master was leaving for a journey and he tasked his three servants and his, in, his, in his ranch, his estate. He says, here, I'm gonna give you three pieces of money. One, I'm gonna give you this amount, largest amount. The other one, a minimum amount. And the other one, halfway in between. And basically that was a test. And he wanted to know what he would 
those servants would do, those, those, those staff members would do with his money while he was gone. And then one acted in a spirit of fear. He just buried it. That one was given the least amount of money. The one that was given the minimum amount, he doubled it. The one that was given the most amount, he doubled it. And I remember, and I remember reading that scripture again, and like, why did he give him different amounts? And the master gave him different amounts according to their ability. And as I reflect on my career, my, my, my time in the military, getting involved in the insurance business, every year I got involved in the insurance business and started compounding, did my ability, not only as an insurance professional, increase, but did my ability as a leader, did my ability as an entrepreneur, did my ability as a husband, a, a father, did that also increase? Because if it does, then the master can then give you more added blessings because he knows then what you're able to do with the added blessings based on your ability to grow as a human being. That's incredible. So basically um, what you're saying is that concept being unpacked. Do you have several videos on this specifically? Uh, we, got a, we, got, we got a whole series. We're unpacking a proverb a week for the next 31 weeks. I think we're in uh, episode 15 right now. We got a bunch okay, of them right on YouTube channel, yeah. Right on. What's another concept, man, that you really felt like changed your perspective and your audience really resonated with? Oftentimes, people in the multicultural middle class says, well, you know, I don't believe in life insurance. You know, I, I'm, I, I don't believe, man, I don't know if it's a thing, it's a scam. Listen, in, in, in Proverbs, it says, it's wise for you to live an inheritance for your children's children. And I'm thinking to myself, well, what's, what's, the, what's the easiest way for me to leave an inheritance outside of the intellectual wisdom, the, the, the intellectual inheritance, the, the experience? Uh, uh, that I can hand on to my kids, which is really when I do a YouTube video, I think about that all the time. I'm thinking to myself, when I pass away, I not gonna say, I'm on my way to heaven. Uh, uh, I'm gonna ask YouTube, hey, by the way, can you deactivate my account? Can I ask Facebook to deactivate my account? Can I ask Instagram to deactivate my account? You can't do that, right? So every time I do a video, I'm thinking about leaving my children an inheritance because they might come across my YouTube channel one day in 2080, 2120, 2120, 2022, the 100 years from now, and look upon their great great grandfather, Matt Sapala, mighty smart guy. So, oh, that's what my great great grandfather looked like in his 40s. This is what he was thinking about. This is how he built his life. This is how he thought about insurance. This is the way he thought. Um, that's one form of inheritance. But one of the easiest ways to leave your children a financial inheritance is really through insurance. So it's not really believing in it like it's a religion. It's a wise thing to do as a steward, meaning that if you're given money, a salary, an opportunity, is because somebody up there felt that you were in the right position to receive it and to manifest and grow, just like the parable of the towns, to grow it, not operate in a spirit of fear, but grow it and see what you do with it. And so therefore you'll be trusted with higher levels of blessings. What, I totally agree, man. Um, and that's that's very wise. I never really thought about it like that. I am actually leaving, because I do a lot of content as well, right? We're doing, you know, we're doing 30 pieces of content a day. That's including all our stories, all of our social, all, all of our YouTube videos and all of that stuff. Um, we also release, you know, a couple of videos a week or whatever, but I never really thought about that. You're right. My kids at one point are going to go see what dad looked like when he was, you know, 38 or whatever. So that's, that's <laughs> interesting. I never, I never thought about that. Um, now let me ask you a question. So what do you feel like it means to be a spirit filled entrepreneur or an entrepreneur that has a, like that, that do you feel like God calls people specifically to be, be entrepreneurs? Uh, I think all of us, to some extent, has some form of entrepreneurial duty. And what does really an entrepreneur do? The definition of entrepreneur is one that takes risk. Everything in life is a risk. And, you know, the, the whole safe, sound, you know, safe, secure type route isn't necessarily the route that the good Lord wants you to walk in because he wants you to continue pushing the envelope. He continues to want to expand the territory. He continues to want to, to, div, di, to if you believe that uh, the good Lord is your savior and, and, and he's about your, that's about your life, that's what you want to do is glorify his name if that's what you feel called upon to do, well, then you've got to take risk. And, and sometimes you got to say, I don't have all the skills, but Lord, and this is one thing I love about entrepreneurship, you don't know when the next client's gonna come. You don't know how to get out of a financial pit sometimes. You don't know all the answers, but if you pray and exercise that faith and you knock, the Bible says, listen, knock, and the door shall be opened, well, right? And then so therefore the answer can enter in. But so my question is to begin with, why do you let wisdom knock on the door? Shouldn't that door be open already? Shouldn't you already be asking questions? Shouldn't you be already asking, hey, listen, can I empty my cup? Can, can I be filled? And I think everybody, to some extent, has some form of entrepreneurial skills. What, what's, what's having a family? What's the purpose of family to take this gift of a, as, a, as a husband and a wife and to create more generations, right? To, to, to take that risk of raising children. I remember when I had my, my I got answered that I had kids, twins on top of that. 
I remember just just bawling in my car, not because it was tears of joy, but like tears like, how am I going to put this together? How am I going to make ends meet? I'm barely make this right now. But it's through that faith, that expressed faith, I said, okay, Lord, what do you want me to do? What, what, what do I need to close that you can close when only door can you only open? And when I started asking myself those type of questions, not, oh my gosh, how am I going to do this? Woe is me. Uh, I'm a, uh, because, you know, uh, I live in the city of Chicago. I can't afford it. I need to lean on somebody else. No, no, I asked. And by the way, I've never leaned on the government for anything, even though I, I could fit that profile. I said, Lord, what can I lean on that you can send my way? And it wasn't government. The answer was never the government. The answer was, okay, I got you this conversation. You need to pick up the phone and talk to this person. You know, uh, open up this bank account and fill this, fill this one up. Right? Whatever the case may be, it was never upon leaning on somebody that can pay my bills. I lean on a good source. A good book to pay my research, to, to pay my bills. Hey Amen. Well, what do you think about there? There seems to be a tone sometimes that um, don't mix faith and business. Um, you know, those are two separate areas of of life. Do Do you believe that? I don't, because I think Why? because how you do one thing is how you do everything. Exactly. I think I think you know it's and don't, don't mix faith and politics. Why? Well, wasn't it Nathan the prophet that called out David? on his sin. You know, when, when, you, when, you looked at, when you looked at how things were created in the Bible, if you read in the Word, everything was mixed in. Everything was I- introduced. Uh, if you look at even the way back in England, I'm, I was watching this, uh, this, this movie uh, on the way back on American Airlines, The Last Duel, right? The Last Duel. Uh, it was a very interesting movie where, where the church was the court. <laughs> the church was the court. Uh, the the removal of how we live about, I mean, the way our country was created through Judeo-Christian principles, right? We, the people, right? That uh, uh, that we come here to this country, that people, this, cre- this country was created based on those principles of faith and those things. And why did those get removed? And now that those things have been removed from our school system, now you see the craziness that's going about in our school system, the craziness going about in our country, the craziness going on in our finances, the craziness going on in our relationships, we remove certain values and principles that the good book has allowed us to understand and how it's transcended the, the, the test of humankind, I think, I think by going back and revisiting, and I think that a lot of people have been rejecting it because they don't like having religion shoved down their throat. I totally understand that. And I think, I think us as believers need to sell our faith better than, than damning people to hell. Of course, yes. And one of the things I do also think that there's a tacky way to go about it to where you can kind of let like the reason to do business with me is because of my faith or like, um, I, I, no offense to if anyone has like a little fish on their business card that I, that is okay in certain circumstances, but that's not quite the point. Why don't I show you uh, my character and my integrity, um, my ethics, my principles that are biblically based. And that should make me the best businessman that you've ever come across without even talking about it but then if we can get into the why are you so successful and excellent and wise etc well hey look just because i've just taken the opportunities that my dad walked me into because psalms 23 says he's a shepherd he goes before you he makes a way he'll create a banquet table in front of your enemies and if that's not a business scripture then i don't know what is you know yeah. so yeah. that to me is is how i because there's a lot of weird tacky like weird ways to like because you can i think you can mix faith and business improperly and create this weird pressure of like, or going to like your church and like using that as a prospecting thing only. And it's like, well, I'm a believer at here. So you owe me a meeting and all that kind of stuff is awkward. Mm-hmm. Just you just stand on your principles and your faith. And then if it gets into why are you so successful and how'd you become? So then you can open up that. Well, here's actually why I'm doing what I'm doing is because I'm not trying to, you know, I'm, I'm doing this with, with purpose and God's called mm-hmm. me to do this. In fact, I've been in situations, I'm sure you two have been too, Matt, where I've told God, like, entrepreneurship has been so hard for me at certain points in my life that if if I was not supposed to be an entrepreneur, then I wouldn't be one because God has bailed me out so many times. Like there is probably 10 yeah. different scenarios where I'm looking at like the money in the bank account and the payroll expenses coming up and it ain't there. And then all of a yeah. sudden, like a client comes or a relationship comes or something comes. And so if God wanted me out of the entrepreneurial world, then then I would be out. And I also will tell you too, there's been times where it's gotten hard enough for me to say, you know what, maybe I should go uh, I'll just simplify the, the the thought in my head was maybe I should just go preach and teach and, and whatever. And truly, as I as I thought and I meditated on that and I was in God's word, I really felt like God telling me, if you do that, you are quitting yeah. what I'm asking you to do. And you are mm-hmm. taking the easy, easy route in your case, Lena. That doesn't mean that some people aren't called away from business into ministry. That doesn't mean that ministry is, yeah. is less than. I'm not going there. I'm just saying for me and my journey, there's been times where it's been 
look, like, like I'm at the end of my rope, what happens and God has delivered me time and time and time again. And outside of my family, um, and my father, like I have three kids. So outside of my, my wife, my marriage and my three children, nothing has taught me more about my father than business and entrepreneurship. Would you agree with that? Uh, oh man, a hundred percent, you know, and as much as you think that uh, your business, you're trying to perfect your business or you're trying to perfect your kids, it's, it's actually the other way around. <clears throat> There's been some, some great training grounds of uh, how to go about living life. And really, it's one thing to read a scripture on Sundays, but implementing it in business, implementing your life Monday through Saturday, that's what entrepreneurship and the insurance industry has allowed me to do, to actually express it. Because as a provider, if I say to myself, well, how am I going to put the food on the table and the roof over our heads and create opportunities for, for children to go to this schools and, and, and take advantage of these things. Well, I have to be better today than I was yesterday. And if I deviated from things that kept me from becoming better, then I'm just only hurting my, my loved ones. And so and hurting my business, if I don't improve. And when you're looking at, when you look at so many things in, 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 in the Bible and just forget, forget, you know, you just take yourself in this scenario, the people that have hurt me the most, have actually been Christians. I've had a Christian book publishing company basically squeeze me for 5,000 bucks because I didn't want them to publish a draft I had of a book because I wasn't gonna meet their deadline. So I actually bought the rights of that book back just so they wouldn't put, just so they wouldn't push a, a half cocked type of work because that's my name on it. Mm. Exactly. The, the people that in my personal life have stabbed me in the back the most were, were Christians. But it doesn't mean I don't love God. And I, what I realized is that, listen, they are human beings that by grace, listen, Jesus gave his life to me, not because I deserved it, but because by, by grace. So why should I judge people who stabbed me in the back? If my relationship was not vertical, but more horizontal, I'd be hurt many different times because it was about faith. I had a vertical relationship between me and my relationship with, with, with God, my creator uh, up in heaven. Who knows where I'd be? And thank God for God. Well, let me, let me continue on that line of thinking. A lot of people you know, look at Cody and I and what Cody's built and what we've built at Security Marketing. And, you know, three three years ago, we didn't exist. Now we're the largest ad agency in the insurance space. I got, you know, 50 employees in Springfield. I got another 50 across the world. Like we're right. absolutely crushing it. But you know, what's crazy, Matt, is people assume that I've always had like work ethic and I was always this, this you know, this the guy that I am now. But I'm telling you, Matt, and when I was in college, before I knew Christ, before I gave my life to Christ and before I was filled with the Holy Spirit, I was a complete freaking loser, dude. I played probably, <laughs> I'm not kidding. I probably played nine hours of video games a day. I probably, I smoked weed every night. I probably had, I don't know, like two liters of vodka every, you know, every week. Like I was such a loser. And whenever I, and I didn't, I knew I was empty, but I was just, whatever, I was content. But it was funny because the way that I explain it is, is whenever I gave my life to Christ, I'll get into that story at some point if, if we meet again. But what was more important is I hit my knees, I repented and I changed my life. But what else changed for some reason in that moment, all of a sudden I started to feel complete conviction of my laziness. And I started this, God slowly pulled me out. I didn't even realize I was lazy. I just was lazy. I was naturally talented salesman. So I could go, you know, work for six hours and make commissions and do all that. But my whole life was just filled with just complete drudgery of just laziness and smoking weed and all that. And I yeah. just wouldn't, I just couldn't stand for it anymore. And not only, I believe that not only did he give me the skills to be successful, he also gave me the, the desire and the conviction to spit out of my mouth what wasn't going to be what's best for my family in the future. And so I would say that like, if it wasn't for God changing me from the inside out, I wouldn't be at all the businessman that I am now. And he changed who I was. Like I was a complete idiot. And then I started to figure out and fumble along the way. Um, but that alone, you know, what, what are your thoughts on that? Do you feel like, did you have a moment like that? Or have you always sort of grown up at the church or what's your story there? No, I never grew up with the church. Uh, if there's any reason why we went to the church is because there's a wedding or, or we go to church because there's free wine after church. That, that was kind of like, it was, it was a church was like a so, social club, social type of thing amongst the Filipinos in, in Chicago. And so I never looked at it as a way to live your life better. I looked at it as a way because that's the only time I surrounded myself with Filipinos because I was the only Filipino kid in a Latino, African-American, Italian neighborhood. And the Filipinos would get together on Sundays in one area of north side of Chicago. And that's the only time I had an identity of who being Filipino was. But no, it was never about, okay, follow Jesus, follow, you know, follow your faith, Not, nothing like that. It wasn't until I got in the Marine Corps and, uh, and a, uh, a Navy sailor approached me while we are about to, to conduct the operation in, in, in Africa, in Somali, Africa. He just tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, Marine, uh, if you don't come back tonight, do you know you'd end up? I looked at him, I was like, are, are you talking about heaven? 
And he's like, yeah, I'm talking about heaven. I, I said, you know, no, I'm not so sure if I'm going to go to heaven or not. And he said, would you like to make sure? I said, sure. He, he, he brings me down to the, he said, listen, come down to the ship's library at seven o'clock and I'll make sure I pray for you. I said, I said only, only one condition. He says, what's that? He said, don't tell any of my Marines I'm meeting with you downstairs. <laughs> right? And he says, no problem. I go down to the ship's library at seven o'clock. Guess who I find? Brother White, the Navy sailor, and my whole entire platoon was down there. <laughs> you know? And so, but that, that's, that was my exposure. But then I started realizing, am I just treating this faith, my, this Jesus guy, as another piece of body armor? I just take him off, you know, when I'm not in combat. And then, I, and then somebody led me to, you know, the armor of God you know, scriptures, you know? You don't leave the house without your armor of God on. And so... And so that's how I live my, as I've gone about living my life, is to teach other kids why it's so important because everything, you don't, never know when these type of attacks are going to come your way and you, ha you have to be ready. Amen, man. Well, dude, I appreciate your time. I know you are incredibly busy, man. I appreciate, you know, someone out there is going to listen to this. Someone out there is going to be, you know, sort of, you know, intrigued about this. I would highly encourage you guys to check out his YouTube channel. Why don't you give us a quick plug of your YouTube channel? Um, what is it again? Yeah, it's the Seven Figure Squad, a channel dedicated with content to help you think like a millionaire, strategize like a millionaire, so therefore you can become a first-generation cash flow, faith-based millionaire. Come check us out. Matt, dude, it's been a pleasure. I really appreciate you. Um, have a great rest of the week, and we'll talk soon, all right? Hey, a blessing to be on, man. Thank you for allowing me to openly talk about my faith. Thank you much.